Now, you've probably seen this caricatured many times in movies and television shows, and you might think of a guy maybe standing in Times Square on a sidewalk wearing a sandwich board, and he has proclaimed on this sandwich board. If you don't know a sandwich board, it's not a board made out of sandwiches. It's a piece of wood or cardboard on the front and back, and it's tied over the shoulders, and usually there's a, a religious message on the sandwich board, and almost always that message is, the end is near. The end is uh, near. And whenever you see somebody wearing a sandwich board that says the end is near, you might sort of begin to evaluate what you think of this person. You might wonder if, they, if they're all there, if they're interacting with reality. You might wonder if maybe they, they're a little bit off and they're not seeing things right. What would compel a person to stand on a street corner with a sandwich board on? And what we're going to see about John the Baptist this morning as he was struggling with his understanding of the ministry of Jesus is John the Baptist was not a prophet that came to say the end is near. John the ba Baptist came to say the end is here. It, it's not coming, it's here, it's happening. And that resulted in him struggling a little bit with what he saw happening in the life and ministry of Jesus. So that's the, the title of the message today is the end is here, and we want to look at that and understand what did John the Baptist mean by the end is, is here. It's not near, it's here. What did Jesus mean by that? And then also, how does that influence our understanding what it means to follow Jesus today? How do we fit into the work of God knowing uh, that the end is here? So the first thing we want to understand here this morning is the end is here because the Bible says so. The end is here because the Bible uh, says so. Maybe you've got friends on the East Coast and you work out over the course of time. They're going to they're gonna come visit you here on the West Coast, on the left coast. So they worked it out. And over the course of time, you're making your plans. Are you going to come out? And okay, we're looking forward to when you're going to show up. And finally, you tell them, hey, when you're here, we should take a, some time and, and go down to California. And I see the Oregonians are going, why would you do that? But... Just go with me. The illustration doesn't work if I say something else, okay? So you say, when you get here, we're going to go down to California. It's oh, that's great. We've always wanted to do that. It'll be great. So they come out, and then uh, finally the weekend arrives, and, and you all load up in the car, and, and you drive down to Redding, and you go to Turtle Bay. Uh, you haven't been to Turtle Bay. You look at animals. And, and so you're standing there looking at, in a cage at a, a bear. And you're like, man, this is, look at that bear. It's fluffy and... There's a fence between us. And, and finally, your East Coast friend said, you know what? When, when you said, let's go to California, we didn't think we were going to go look at bears. We thought we'd go to the beach. We thought maybe we'd go to a, an amusement park, maybe Disneyland or Universal Studios. Or maybe we'd drive down to uh, San Francisco and see Fisherman's Wharf or the Golden Gate Bridge. We didn't think we would see a sundial bridge and bears. They said, no, it gets better. We're going to hit in and out on the way home. And they said, there's an in and out of the Rogue Valley Mall. I said, no, 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 it's different in California. It's different in California. It's where it started. It's where it all started. So why, are you, why would your friends be upset there? Because you did exactly what you said you were going to do. We're going to go to California. But what they heard was something different than that. They had built up in their mind what going to California meant, what their anticipation was for that. And then when the time arrived and it didn't happen the way they thought it should, even though you did exactly what you said you were going to do, there was disappointment and there was frustration. John the Baptist, like everyone else at that time, knew that the Messiah came at the end. And they were absolutely right. That's what the Bible teaches. And we'll look at it here in a minute. The Messiah comes at the end. So when the Messiah comes, the end is here. But the problem that John the Baptist was struggling with is the Messiah has come, Jesus, the end is here, got it, this isn't what I expected. Because John the Baptist was sitting in a jail cell, and Jesus was doing what he was doing, and things weren't going the way that John the Baptist thought they would. Jesus shows that he fulfills scripture and he is the Messiah. And John the Baptist and others are going to realize the end is here and it's not the way you thought it was going to be. Look at verses 
uh, 18 through 23. Uh, Merle read them for us, so let's just review. Uh, the disciples of John uh, reported to John everything that Jesus was doing. We don't know this from the book of Luke because it doesn't mention here that he is in prison. But in the other gospels, we understand that at this point in his life, he has already been imprisoned. So he is sending his disciples from prison, and he's doing so because he's starting uh, to wonder. This is verse 19. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? That was a straightforward question. Jesus, are you the Messiah, or is someone else coming? And, and John the Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus this question so that he could find out, is, am I understanding this right? Because I'm in jail. Things aren't going the way I think they ought to be going, and I need to know who you are. I thought you were the Messiah, but now, because things aren't fitting in the way I thought they were going to, I'm not exactly sure how this is going. We, we have to understand about John here. His concern is not theological. He doesn't think Jesus is a heretic. He doesn't think Jesus is teaching anything false. John isn't questioning his view of the Old Testament or his understanding of God. He's not questioning reality or truth. He's trying to rectify what he understands and believes with what's happening in the world around him. So also his struggle is not skeptical or cynical. He's not in his jail cell wondering whether or not the Bible is true or wondering whether or not Jesus is teaching truth or not. He's just in a place where, okay, here's what I thought would happen and it's not happening. I don't know what to do with that. How, what he wanted to know was, was, how do I rectify what I'm seeing in real time in my life with the Messiah that I anticipated? His understanding was when the Messiah shows up, the end happens. What do you think John was anticipating when the end comes? Not jail. And the people who put him in jail, he would think, wouldn't be in power anymore. Because who put him in jail? Herod. Because John told him the truth. He was living an immoral life. And John would have understood like every other Jewish person at that time, when the Messiah comes, he's going to establish his own kingdom and other kingdoms are going to be cast aside. And, and so now I'm sitting in jail and maybe, I'm, maybe it's just coming. Maybe all of a sudden Jesus is going to show up and open up the prison door and I'll go walking out and I'll sit on the throne. I, we don't know exactly what John is thinking, but, but clearly the experience of his life and, and the understanding of the scripture and, and what he saw Jesus doing, they weren't fitting together the way he would have expected. So his disciples go to Jesus and, and they ask Jesus that question. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus got really angry and smacked him upside the head and said, stop asking hard questions. He didn't do that. Okay, I'm, I'm being ridiculous. And why do I say it that way? Because that's what we normally do. Stop asking hard questions. Stop talking about the reality of how you experience tension in the real time of life with what you know is true from the Bible. These, is, these are things we should talk about and bring up and say, hey, I'm not sure. I understand what God says. I understand who Jesus is. But here's my life. I, I, don't, I can't figure out how these, these things all fit. Jesus had no problem with that question. But look what he did. He didn't really answer. Verse 21. In that hour... He healed many people of diseases and plagues. Now, you may wonder what the difference is between a disease or plague. There, it's kind of not a lot of difference other than plagues, we might think, are diseases you have that hurt. So a disease might be uh, something that you have that, but isn't ongoing uh, painful, but it's a, a, a something you have. Plague is, is something that on, a, on the daily, it, it hurts. It's a chronic pain uh, or a condition that is, is really hard. It, they cast out evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And then he tells the disciples of John, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. And then he explains to them what they've seen and heard in case they weren't paying attention. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. 
So what Jesus does is through his actions, he says real loud, I fulfill the scripture. I am the Messiah to come because the Bible said the Messiah will do these things. And we're just going to go to two scriptures uh, briefly. First one is Isaiah 61. One. Certainly Jesus was referring to this passage as he was communicating with the disciples of John. I'm going to read Isaiah 61, 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to do what? Bring good news to the poor. So Jesus referenced this specifically. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound. John might have been thinking of that passage as he was sitting in prison. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Verse 4, they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. So Jesus here in saying he's proclaiming good news to the poor, which the disciples of John could observe, is saying, I fulfill Isaiah 61. And John is, is struggling with the reality of this. Okay, Jesus is saying he fulfills the Old Testament, yet at the same time, the ancient cities aren't built up yet. The captives aren't released. How does John know the captives aren't released? Because he's not, right? Captives aren't released. I'm still in jail. Romans are still in charge, and the Messiah doesn't seem to be bothered at all. But Jesus makes clear. Look at your Bible. I'm doing exactly what the Old Testament said I would be doing. Isaiah 35 touches on this as well. I'm going to read Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. We have to always remember when we're reading through the Gospels and you're seeing Jesus heal people of blindness and, and, and the lame so that they can walk and casting out demons. On the one hand, he was showing compassion to those who were under these significantly difficult circumstances. More than that, he was fulfilling scripture so that all who observed him would agree he is the Messiah the Old Testament anticipated. And that's what Jesus is telling John through his disciples. Look what I'm doing. What am I doing? I'm doing all of the stuff Isaiah said I would do. The Messiah is here. The end is here because the Bible says the Messiah is here because I'm doing all of the stuff that was anticipated. Jesus makes it clear he fulfills Old Testament scripture and he wants John to get it into his head and for us to get it into our head. The Messiah is here, which means the end is here. So what's the problem? Verse 23 of Luke chapter 7. Blessed, this is Jesus still speaking, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. That's the trouble. Jesus is the Messiah. He fulfills the Old Testament scripture. The end is here and some are going to be offended. And he wants John to understand. Don't be offended, John. Don't be offended. And what does it mean to be blessed by not being offended by Jesus? First of all, this phrase, blessed, is hearkening back to that sermon he gave in Luke chapter 6. And I want to read it. It'll be up on the screens for you. Luke chapter 6, beginning verse 20. This is sort of the Beatitudes in Luke. There's also a version of these over in Matthew. Jesus lifted his eyes onto his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, you shall laugh. 
Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. So in this blessing here, Jesus makes it clear. Blessed are you who poor, are poor. And, and, and people like John in the situation he was in, he goes, I want the end to be here so I'm not poor. So I'm not in prison. Blessed are you who hunger now. And, and the people listening, would, well, we thought when the Messiah came, hunger is done. And what he is saying is, I am here, the kingdom is here, but the end is not a moment, it's a time. And during that time, it's a continued opportunity to put faith in the work of God, trusting him, knowing that it's not fulfilled yet. We're not home yet. Look what he says. Great, uh, for behold, your reward is great in where? Heaven, not Friday. You know, we're willing to wait a little bit. That we're like, till Friday. Of course, today's Sunday. So maybe Wednesday is better. Friday's a long way. Look, there's a lot of real estate between now and Friday. Maybe Wednesday would be better. And Jesus is, is helping us in these blessings reorient our expectations of what it means for the end to be here. John was thinking the end is here. Heaven is here. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. The end is here. Heaven is still coming. There's still a time of faith and patient endurance uh, to be worked through. So blessed are you when you, in these moments of sadness and hunger and weeping and poverty, still put faith in Christ knowing the kingdom uh, is here. So blessed are you are, who are not offended by Jesus, Jesus says. Blessed are you who are not offended by me. What does it mean to be offended? And so I kind of came up with a way of thinking through this a little bit to make it maybe a little more simple. The person who offended is offended is this, says this, I know what Jesus is like. And the Jesus I'm experiencing in my life is not that Jesus. I, I know what Jesus is supposed to do. Jesus, when I show up and I stop saying naughty words or I stop being rude, I am then supposed to have good stuff happen to me. That's what the guy on the TV said. That if I'm really nice to people and I give that guy lots of money, I'm going to get rich. So I know what Jesus is like. My experience of him isn't what I think it's supposed to be. So therefore, I'm offended by Jesus. You're not offended by Jesus. You're offended by pretend Jesus. Because pretend Jesus doesn't exist. The biblical Jesus says, the end is here, but the kingdom is still being fulfilled. Offense is when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations of what Jesus is supposed to be like, even though he's doing everything the Bible said he would do. We, we're offended when Jesus meets the Bible's expectations, but not ours. And that's what John was struggling with. John was sitting in a cold prison, probably not being fed a lot, wondering how long he would be alive, wouldn't be long. And the Messiah he anticipated isn't matching the Messiah who is. And then he was struggling with that. And he was offended by that. And Jesus said, don't be offended. The Messiah who is, is the best Messiah you could possibly have. Because he's the Messiah. Even though he's not necessarily meeting the expectations that John had, or the, ble or the expectations we had. What does it mean to be blessed? If, if being offended, it says, I know what Jesus is like, and I don't like what he's doing or he's not doing in my life. What does it mean to be blessed? Here's what it means to be blessed. Are you ready? Too blessed to be stressed? Well, okay, then maybe not. Blessed in Jesus is this. When Jesus isn't what we think he ought to be, and by faith we take our agenda of what Jesus should be and say, never mind, God. You do what you're going to do. So blessed is sacrificing, giving up our agenda for Jesus and receiving by faith the Jesus the Bible tells us about. The Jesus who came to provide forgiveness of sin through death on the cross. The Jesus who came, who rose from the dead on the third day that we could live forever with 
him in glory. He is God who comes and saves us through forgiveness and resurrection. And we surrender our, Jesus, our, our, our agenda for Jesus where we say, yes, I'll take forgiveness, resurrection, and this week being a good week and everything going my way. And bless, blessing happens in our life when by faith we say, you know what? Forget my agenda, God. My, my agenda is not worth it. I just want your agenda. And that's what Jesus was calling John the Baptist to do in prison. He said, stick with me, John, give up your agenda of freedom from prison and instead be blessed by faith in the Messiah who is. The end is here because the Bible says so. Jesus may not be acting the way we want him to act. He may not make, be making our lives the way we want him to make our lives. And the question is, are we going to enjoy the blessing of Christ by trusting God that he's good and he knows exactly what he's doing? And we can set aside our preconceived notions of what Jesus ought to be doing. The end is here because the Bible says so. Now, I want to just mention this. Uh, if we fail to recognize uh, how Jesus has made himself to know, be known in Scripture, we risk missing the message that he really wanted to give us. And that's the second part of this passage in verses 24 through 35. So if we, we miss Jesus because of our preconceived notions, we risk missing the message that he has for us. So the end is here because the Bible says so. Secondly, the end is here. Don't uh, miss the message. Everyone has an agenda about what they want from God. Everyone does. If you're saying, well, I don't have an agenda of what I want from God. Well, good for you. I don't believe you, but good for you. <laughs> Everyone has an agenda about what they want for God. We have to be careful not to miss Jesus if he doesn't fit our agenda. So we can imagine these friends down at Turtle Bay. Do you remember that story at the beginning? <laughs> Staring at the bear. And the friend turns to you and says, you know what? A friend wouldn't do this. A friend wouldn't do this. We're going to fly out of here. If this is how friends work, we don't need you as friends. So what happens in that moment is in their disappointment, they miss the bigger issue. There were some friends. There were some friends. And so they miss it because, because of their, their disappointment and their expectations have been wrecked. That's what we risk doing. We risk missing what Jesus really has for us because we won't let go of our agenda, which results in this offense. Jesus is supposed to be a particular way. And here's the message that we're going to hear in these verses to come. The end is here. Everyone who lives and endures the end after John is greater than John. That if you're living and enduring by faith in Christ after John, you're greater than John the Baptist. Let's read it. I'm going to read verses 24 through 35. You ready? I'm going to read it anyway. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? Excuse me. A prophet? Yes, but I tell you more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born among of women, none is greater than John. Yet... The one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. That is John. Verse 31. Jesus continues, To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They're like children sitting in a marketplace and calling to one another. We played a flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. John the Baptist came eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. 
Why did you go out to see John? Did you go out to see the scenery? Did you go out to see the beautiful vegetation? Did you go out to see the beautiful views? No. He was in the desert. There's nothing to see there. Did you go out to see people displayed in beautiful clothing? Did you go out to see the the uh, extraordinary beauty of how John would dress himself and, and hold himself? No, if you want to see that stuff, you go to a palace, go to a fashion show, you go to a, a drama. What was John wearing? He, he was wearing a camel skin and belt like any prophet would wear. So why would you go out to John? There's no scenery out there. There's no beautiful clothing to watch. Why would you go out to see John? Because he's a prophet. He's got something to say that you want to pay attention to. So Jesus is saying, you went out to hear John because he has a prophet. But guess what? John is more than a prophet. How is John more than a prophet? Here's what Jesus is saying. John is the prophet that ends all of the prophets, so to speak. Think of it this way. All of the prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Hezekiah. No, he's a king. All of these guys proclaimed the Messiah is to come. All of them said, hope in the Lord, because his Messiah, the branch, as Isaiah would say, he's coming. The, the son of David, he's coming. And it was an anticipation for the people of Israel to keep their hope. The Messiah is coming. How is John different? He's here. No other prophet got to do that. John is the only Old Testament prophet, and John is an Old Testament prophet. He's the only Old Testament prophet that said, the Messiah's not coming. He's over there. Check him out. I can't tie his shoes. Uh, yeah, there he is. No other prophet got to do that. So by nature of the time in which he lived, not because of anything he did, not because he was a great communicator. He had something special about him. What was special about John is when God called him. He called him as a prophet to proclaim, not the Messiah is coming, but what? The Messiah is here. So there's no prophet greater than John. Would you like Isaiah who's saying the Messiah is coming? Or would you like John who's saying Messiah is here? I'll take Messiah is here, please. And so John is the, no one is greater than John, Jesus is saying. And who is grateful for John's message? Look what it says in verse 29 and 30. All the people heard this. The tax collectors too, they declared God just because they'd been baptized by John. What was John's baptism? It's a baptism of repentance. You come down to John and say, John, I want to get baptized. You say, sure, it's no problem. All I need you to do is tell me all the sins you've done. I'm sorry, what? Just today, this week? It's a baptism of repentance. And repentance is saying, I want relationship with God. I want to turn away from the evil I have done, thought, and said, and I want to have a relationship with God. And John says, get baptized is a way of saying, I want to turn away from sin and to God. All of the people who had a lot of sin to turn away from, and they were experiencing guilt and shame and conviction, they were ecstatic about John. John shows up and says, the end is here. And the tax collectors go, that's a problem. I'm not ready for the end. If the end shows up, I'm judged. If the Messiah shows up, I'm done for. And John says, no problem. Get baptized. Then you'll be prepared for the Messiah to come. And the tax collectors are saying what? This is fantastic. I can be re- prepared for the end by, by repenting. So when the Messiah comes, I'm good to go. And what do the Pharisees and religious leaders say? I don't want to repent. I got nothing to repent of. I'm amazing. The Messiah should be coming to me. And being, I want to be affirmed of my greatness and my religiosity and how I don't do this and I do these things. So the sinners who were concerned and had a fear of the Lord, they were excited about John because John provided them the means to relate with God rightly through repentance and faith. The religious leaders didn't like John. Why? We don't want sinners relating rightly with God. We want to be right, relating rightly with God and for the sinners to be on the outside. So this Messiah and John didn't meet with their their approval. So the sinners are grateful for John's baptism. And John is called the greatest of all time because he is the one saying, I am preparing the way for the Messiah through repentance. And guess what? There he is. I mean, it's fantastic. Isaiah would say, I want you to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. When is he coming? No idea. No idea. 
Well, what are we supposed to do, Isaiah? Trust the Lord and wait. John, there's a great message. As he could say, oh, when he was coming. Now, look what Jesus, he tells a little parable to help us understand the tension between the sinners and the religious leaders. Now, I should say the religious leaders were sinners. The Bible always characterizes people by their self-perspective. So the tax collectors saw themselves as sinners. The religious leaders did not. So he tells this little parable in verse 32. They're like children sitting in a marketplace calling out to each other. So children are sitting in the marketplace. And what's the problem? They're supposed to be playing. They're children. In fact, they make a, a point. They're sitting there because they're annoyed. The kids wouldn't play their games. So you've got this group of kids sitting around. We won't, we're mad at you. We played the flute. You wouldn't dance. Then we sang a sad song and you wouldn't play cry with us. And who are, they, who are the children complaining about? They're complaining about Jesus and John the Baptist. They're saying, no, look, why aren't you playing our games the way we play it? And Jesus and John the Baptist, we're not going to play your games. We're going to forgive sinners who repent. We're going to provide hope to those who seek God through forgiveness. And there's no meeting the expectations of these whiny children in the marketplace. I, I shouldn't say whiny. No, I should. Because there was no meeting their expectations. John the Baptist came as a Nazarite, an ascetic. He, he ate only locusts and honey. I hope, boy, that would take a lot of honey for me. It'd be mostly honey for me. Locusts and honey, and he, and he was a Nazarite, meaning he didn't drink alcohol the entire time uh, he was on earth. Whereas Jesus came eating whatever you put in front of him, and he, was, he would drink wine as well. And, and so there's no making these people happy. They won't play because they only play certain games, and, and Jesus and, and John aren't playing their religious game. So the accusations start flying. John is crazy. Jesus is a sinner. And they're going to miss the message of hope that is coming to them. And the message is fantastic. The message is this. Any who follow during this time are, by their very nature, even greater than John. Look at it, verse 28. Look at verse 28. Among those born among women, no one is, none is greater than John. Yet, one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than than John. He's saying that those of us who come after John, who are living this time, during the time of the end, the time of the kingdom, the kingdom has come, but it's not yet fully fulfilled. We're living in a very unique time, the time of the spirit indwelling all who believe, a time of those who believe without having seen Jesus raised from the dead. And Jesus is saying, this is a time where walking with God is even greater than what John did. Okay, a couple of things, and then we're going to wrap it up and take communion. John struggled because Jesus wasn't what he expected. And I want to make this clear. Struggling is not failure. John didn't fail here. He struggled the way every other person ever has. John had in his mind, here's, I trust Jesus. Rome is gone. I don't go to jail. Life may not be perfect, but at some point, the kingdom comes in. And he didn't have in his expectations, jail beheaded. And because what he expected was different than what the king, God was actually doing in his kingdom, he struggled. And I don't know what your struggle is, but we all have these struggles where we say, okay, here's what I thought it meant to follow the God. And here's, here's what's actually happening. And these two things don't work. I don't know where it happens in how long you've been a Christian or when it happened in your life. But at a certain point, you probably said to yourself, okay, I trusted Jesus I thought it was going to be different than this. This isn't exactly this isn't exactly what I thought was going to happen. I thought things were going to go differently than they, than they have. And, you know, maybe you don't want to admit that. I feel like that's universal. And if it's not universal, well, I want to be polite. Well, why start now? Um, it is universal. I don't know how to say this. If it hasn't happened, you just set the clock. It's coming. At a certain point, something's going to happen. And you say, wait a minute, Lord. I didn't think that was an option following you. And it's not because it's something the Bible said. It's because we have tried to restrict God by an agenda we have. And John struggled with that reality. And we struggle with that. And that isn't failure. It's an opportunity for worship. 
when, when the realities of our life doesn't match up what we thought things were supposed to be like, the, the worship element is when we turn that over to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I had expectations here that aren't in the Bible. These were things I just created in my own mind, and I'm going to give those to you. And it's hard. I'm disappointed. I'm sad. John did not suddenly... Notice the Bible never saw that the, uh, the disciples didn't return to John, and they say, hey, no, Jesus is the Messiah. And he goes, oh, well, yippee da do da day. Let's play Yahtzee. I'm in a better mood now. It doesn't say that. We have no idea what happened, but it's not all of a sudden everything was cheery. And he's decorating his cell. No, that's not what it says. He doesn't say all of a sudden life got easy. It just means he, he by worship, can, can turn over his expectation to what the Lord is doing. And this is a struggle. So John struggled because things weren't fitting what he expected. We need to contrast this with the religious leaders. The religious leaders weren't struggling. They were condemned. Not because they struggled with Jesus, but because they knew he was the Messiah, and this was not the Messiah they wanted. That's a whole other thing. Jesus shows up and says, I have come to forgive sins. And the religious leader said, yeah, we don't need any of that action. What we need is someone to fix our political system. What we need is somebody to reestablish the, the religious system as the power brokers of this country. What we need is somebody to get rid of Rome. What we need somebody is to fix our economy. What we need is somebody to keep feeding the 5,000. What we need is, and they had, and when Jesus said, I'm not that guy, they said, we don't need you as our Messiah. To reject Jesus as the Messiah because he's not the Messiah you want is not the same as struggle. That's condemnation, saying you want a different Savior. Jesus came to save us from our sins and give us eternal life. Not necessarily to make our lives better today. The end is here. The Bible says so. The end is here. Don't miss the message. Those living today, that's us, are even greater than John the Baptist. That doesn't feel right to say, but say it. That's what the Bible says. Three things, and then we're going to take communion. Ready? Jesus is the Savior anticipated by the Scripture. He fits everything the Old Testament said about the Messiah. Absolutely true. He brings salvation to everyone who believes in him. He is the Passover sacrifice that rose from the dead. The end is here. The Bible says Jesus is the Messiah. He came to bring forgiveness of sins, to uh, participate in the kingdom of God that is being ushered in even today, requires faith in Jesus for forgiveness of sins. That's what he came to bring. Forgiveness of sins, redemption, and eternal life. The way to participate that is to trust him by admitting that you also are a sinner and need forgiveness. And Jesus gives eternal life to all who would trust him. If you don't need forgiveness of sins, you do not need Jesus, and he's not offering anything else. That's it. Okay, second thing. For those of us who are Christians, all of us from time to time, or maybe all the time, will wonder... I thought Jesus would, I don't know, fill in the blank there. I don't know what it is for you. I thought Jesus would give the Seahawks more insight into the draft. Than they, that's really frustrating. I, that's really out of line. That's a pro. I thought Jesus would make ends meet a little better than he has. I thought Jesus would keep the people around me a little healthier than he has. I thought Jesus would, you know, do some things in the country I'm not seeing happening. I thought Jesus would with my children or my grandchildren. I thought Jesus would at my work. I thought, I thought, I trusted Jesus. I get up and read my Bible. I pray. So I thought, therefore, he would, and whatever's in the blank there can be a problem. Now, he might. Sometimes he does. Why does he do that? Because he's awesome. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he just gives us stuff and makes things go great, and that's fantastic. Other times, not. The I thought Jesus would, and when he didn't, experiencing that disappointment, that's a part of living for Christ in a broken world. 
The question is, in that moment of disappointment, what are we going to do? Are we going to worship and turn that disappointment over to Christ and say, not my will, but yours be done? Or are we going to hold on to our expectations and say, Jesus, I'll love you when you do things my way. And that creates a lot of frustration and difficulty. The end is here. Don't miss the message. Jesus came to give us new life. And during the time now, we will experience struggle. Greatness in the kingdom of God. Finally, role, uh, God gives us uh, each a role uh, during the time in which we are alive. And I, I'm going to say it this way, and I hope this doesn't offend you. Or, and this might be considered an opinion, so I'd be willing to argue with you. Um, well, I'd be willing to make it look like I'm arguing, but in my mind, I think I'm right. No, it's not right. The greatest time to be a servant of God by faith is right now. John chapter 20, verse 29. John chapter 20, verse 29. Have you believed because you have seen me? Jesus is talking to his disciples. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet have believed. Number one, we are blessed more than the apostles. Why? We have believed without seeing an empty grave. Without seeing him in the garden. Without eating fish he just cooked. Without eating bread he just broke. John is the greatest because he came as uh, the prophet at a particular time. We, in this time, we have a unique place in history. What's our unique place in history? No other generation has believed Christ so far from when he rose from the dead. No one else, no other generation in history yet has believed Christ so close to the end. I don't know when it is. It might be another 2,000 years. I don't know. But no one yet has believed this close to that time. Can you believe it? Do you think Peter really thought people would believe 2,000 years later? Yet here we are, not by our own goodness or greatness, but only because of the kindness of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We say, yes, Jesus is alive. And people say, that was 2,000 years ago. And we say, I know, not a problem, still alive. So we stand here in a unique place. So right now, Christian, I don't care if you're awesome sauce Christian or lame Christian. And I'm, that's by your evaluation. This is how the grace of God works. It's kooky. We don't like it because we're religious. How many of us aren't very good at your Christian faith? Don't raise your hand. Raise your hand for the person next to you. <laughs> I don't care how not good you are at being a Christian. I don't even know how you define that. Greater than John. Have you ever thought about that way? You say, no, no, I, are you saying right now, I couldn't be greater than he ate locusts and honey? I'm reading my Bible. If you are in the kingdom of God, after John, greater than, not because you're awesome, but because God is kind enough to work by his spirit in your life in this generation, in Jesus right now, greater than John. John got to work when Jesus was walking around. You've had to live your entire Christian life. You've never seen him. Can you believe that? And it's not because you're great. It's because his Holy Spirit is doing that work in your heart. We should grab onto that with some joy. Some resilience. Say, wow, God, I can't believe what you did there. That's amazing. The end is here. Don't miss the message. Because of God's guidance, kindness and goodness to us in Christ, even today, by faith, we live a life blessed even beyond what John the Baptist could experience. Let's take communion together as a way of worshiping Christ in this moment. Uh, so why don't we open up the, the elements. As always, I like to recommend you open up the bread side first. It's a little bit easier to do. I understand we're using the definition of the term bread loosely. This little wafer. A couple of things about Jesus in the night that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples, that Passover meal in Luke chapter 22, he said something interesting, which I think lends itself to this understanding that the end is here, but also not quite yet here. The end isn't a moment, it's an age that we're living in. Here's what Jesus said in Luke twenty-two seventeen: He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. I tell you, that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. But Jesus sort of marks the beginning of the end by saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to drink from the fruit of the vine until 
the end of the end. Jesus marks this moment with some sense of significance and even seriousness. That this is a, an important time period in the working of God's redemption among humankind. That period of time where people will be living by faith in God after he has raised from the dead. And Jesus is saying, you, the end is here, but you're going to have to live in and through that time of the end. And it's going to have unique trials and challenges, unique uh, from any other time. The kingdom is here, but that's obvious. It's fullness is not yet to come. Jesus died. He rose from the dead. And because of his sacrifice, maybe we're moved by his scripture here this morning to be willing to set aside our agenda for what we think Jesus should be doing in our life. I don't know what that is for you. I want you to think about it relatively specifically. What are the, what are the areas of maybe disappointment or struggle in your life where you thought, Jesus, I thought this was going to happen. It's not panning out and it's frustrating. What are those areas for you where you need to turn that over to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because he died and rose from the dead for our forgiveness. And it's opportunity in this moment to express faith through worship by saying, as people of the end, we're just going to root our, we're going to hitch our wagon to the risen Savior. Not what I think he ought to be doing in my life in the short term. So let's take a moment and pray. What we're going to do is I want to give you an opportunity to seek the Lord through worship in confession and repentance. You can pray in your heart, of course. What we're talking about here is praying in our heart and minds. Lord, here are the areas where I'm struggling like John did. Frustration, disappointment, struggle. Give me the strength by faith to turn that over to you. And instead of having my expectations on you, Lord, give me willingness to trust you. So let's take a few minutes and pray as the Lord leads in that way. After just a few minutes, I will pray a thanksgiving for the, the bread and the cup. Then I'll read from scripture and we'll take communion together. Let's pray. God, hear us as we come before you with our repentance and our confession and our thanksgiving. Father, we thank you for being here with us by your grace, by the power of the Spirit and the work of Jesus. We thank you, God, that as people who struggle, experience frustration and disappointment and have questions, wonder what the future holds, we're grateful, God, that you don't turn us aside. But as we see in this account with Jesus, you look for ways to help us to see what you're up to that we might trust you. We freely admit, God, that we have expectations and continue to have expectations of what it would be like to walk with you. And, and we experience a disappointment when we discover that's not the way it's going to be. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would give us the strength to set aside our agenda and our expectations and instead rest in Jesus and what he's doing. We thank you for the bread, which is a symbol of Jesus' broken body, where he took on himself the punishment for sin that we should have taken. We thank you for the cup, Lord, a symbol of Jesus' shed blood, where you made a promise that all who trust in him are forgiven and live forever. We thank you, God, that Jesus isn't dead, but that he rose from the dead, so we have hope of life eternal. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's eat and drink together. Thank you.